Hi, this is Miss Clemmy, and welcome to the podcast on bone articulations. So today in this video, we're going to take a look at the bone articulations in the axial and appendicular skeleton. So if we look at the appendicular skeleton, that's the color portion shaded in blue. So a, an articulation in the axial, or excuse me, appendicular skeleton would be your shoulder joint. Um, or your elbow joint, or even the little tiny joints in your wrists that make up your carpals. We'll also take a look at the bone articulations or bone joint in the axial skeleton, which is the cream colored portions, the cranium, the thorax, and the backbone. So to begin, let's start from the top down, the axial skeleton and the skull. Well, the skull really is two major features for articulations, and the first are sutures. So uh, when you're an adult, let's say if you're looking from the top down, this is your frontal bone, and it forms a suture or a joint with the parietal bone. And so those sutures are fused bone together that allows absolutely no movement. Now the other feature of your cranium bones are the sinuses, and these are actual bone cavities, little, little, little holes, little coves, if you will, inside your bones, and most of those, at least in the skull, drain into your nose, hence a sinus infection. Now I do want to compare the skull sutures in an adult, that great drawing that I just did, and an infant skull. And in an infant skull, they have soft spots called fontanelles. And so those fontanelles are cartilage, and they allow both not only the brain to grow, but also the bones of the cranium to get a little bit larger. So there's space for everything to increase in size. Now, once that's happened, those uh, cranium bones will fuse together and form sutures. If we move a little bit lower in the axial skeleton, we reach the thorax. And the thorax, and the main component there is your rib cage. And it forms a protective cage for all of those vital organs within it. And so there's a couple different types of ribs that form the rib cage. The first are the true ribs. It's seven pairs that are directly attached to the breastbone. There are five pairs of false ribs which are indirectly attached to the sternum. Uh, if you can see here, they all kind of join with some cartilage to the sternum. And then we have four or two pairs of floating ribs, which aren't attached to anything. And so there's a lot of protection there with your ribs, but there's also a lot of flexibility with the cartilage to allow your chest to expand um, and contract for breathing purposes. Now if we move on to the appendicular skeleton, there we're going to discuss the arms, the shoulder, the legs, and what we see here, the pelvic region. Now what we're looking at are male and female um, pelvic regions. Here's a male, this is a female. And if you take a close look at this, you can, you can see the differences. Well, sure, they both have an ilium, they both have the iliac crest. Over here, the greater sciatic notch, the acetabulum, the obturator foramen, the pubic bone, the ischium, um, the sacrum, and the coccyx. But the difference doesn't lie in the bones that they have or don't have. The difference you can see is the size of the opening between, between the two ilium. In females, it's much larger. And that makes sense. Females have to fit a baby through there. Males don't have to worry about that. So that's really the major difference between the two skeletons, um, besides the obvious fact that in males, generally, most every bone is just a little bit larger. All right, so as we look at the appendicular skeleton, there's lots of different types of articulations or different types of joints. 
So what we're going to look at now is arthrology, which is the study of those joints. It's the study of where two or more bones come together. And so there are different types of joints, as you can imagine. The first are the synarthrotic joints, like the sutures that I had mentioned earlier in this video, which allow absolutely no movement at all. The next set of joints are the amphiarthrotic joints, and they allow for a little bit of movement. These are like the, the vertebrae in your backbone and the pubic bone in your pelvic region. But the ones that are studied more often, um, not only because they're more injury prone, but because they allow a little more movement, are the diarthrotic joints, such as in your knee, in your elbow or your shoulder. So that's what we're going to look at next, are the diarthrotic joints. Now what you're looking at here is a pretty intense picture of a knee. Um, you can see the upper bone is the femur, we have the tibia on the bottom, and the patella is a little kneecap kind of between the two on the right. And I'm going to show you some of the basic terminology that's associated with diarthrotic joints by using the knee as an example. But all of these other things also occur in the shoulder, um, in the elbow as well. Okay, So what we're going to do is work from the outside in. So to start everything off, the first thing in a joint is the joint capsule. And this is like those tight under armor um, sleeves, if you will that fit over everything in the joint and really kind of hold all those pieces of the puzzle together. Then the next thing, the obvious thing, would be the bones in the joint. So in this case we have the femur, down here we have the tibia, and then the patella. Now on the ends of those bones is articular cartilage. Okay, just another safety feature to keep bone from grinding on bone. Now it wouldn't be a joint if we can't attach the bones to anything, so we have ligaments in those joints to connect bone to bone. And the more motion that you have in a joint, the more ligaments that have to be there to connect all those moving parts together. So, so far we have the capsule, we have the bone, we have ligaments, articular cartilage, but there is still going to be some space between everything. So we call that open space the joint cavity. And within that joint cavity, there is a, a membrane that secretes synovial fluid. So there's another safety feature in a joint to make sure that there's enough lubrication to allow for movement. And in some joints, there may be even extra cartilage and extra cushion, like in the case of the knee, there's the meniscus, which is more cartilage. So that's their basic joint structure, starting on the outside with joint capsule and working all the way to the inners um, of the, the, the joint with the synovial membrane and the synovial fluid. So here we are, an up-close look at the diarthrotic joints. First one is the ball and socket. I put this one first because it has the most movement. It allows for free range of motion in your shoulder here. And you can see this is all the joint and there's lots of connective tissue to make sure all of those bones come together and allow for proper movement. The next diarthrotic joint is the hinge. You can find them in your elbow and your knee. They allow for back and forth movement. And even in the phalanges in your fingers, they don't go side to side, they go back and forth. The third type of diarthrotic joint is a pivot joint found in your neck, in your top two vertebrae, to help rotate side to side and a little bit of up and down. Next one is a saddle joint. This is a really unique joint to us primates because it allows our thumb to have that opposable motion in circles. And it kind of fits like a saddle, as you can see in the picture with those blue arrows back and forth. The last one is a gliding joint. These are the joints between all the tiny bones in your wrist, like your carpals and your tarsals. 
I'd like to wrap up this vid video by taking a look at the advancements in arthrology. And the two I want to focus in on today are hip replacement and uh, arthroscopic surgery. So here's the first one, um, the arthroscopic surgery. And really all this is, is, is going in for, for surgery and sticking a little pin in that's the camera. And then depending on what types of repairs are making, there's different tools for different types of situations. And they stick those in there and, and, and fix up whatever needs fixing. And essentially you walk out of the OR with maybe two, three, four little puncture wounds around your knee or wherever they were, were operating. And that's it. The greatest thing about this type of surgery is it really cuts down on the amount of healing time needed because it's not so invasive. The other type of advancement um, are hip or, or knee joint replacements. In this picture, you can see the hip replacement and the surgeons that specialize in, in this type of replacement, these orthopedic surgeons, they have this down to a science. They can replace a hip in 45 minutes. So what they do is they lay on your side and they kind of go in from the back uh, of your hip. Um, can't really go in. I mean, it's kind of from the side from there. And so they'll take off the ball of the femur and, and then they'll put in that, that metal shaft into your femur with a new ball on it. They'll replace the acetabulum in your, in your, um, your ilium. And then essentially you're good to go. They'll put you back in socket. They'll they'll staple and close up the incision, and and you're set to to leave that same day. Now the biggest thing with hip replacement surgery is making sure all of those components in the joint capsule are strengthened again. Because you can imagine if you're ripping out the old uh, ball and socket, you're going to tear some of those joint capsule features. So there's the rehab on hip replacements really focuses in on uh, making sure that the capsule, the joint area, has been strengthened after that surgery. So this is a look at the appendicular and axial skeleton, specifically at the joints. So I hope you found that helpful.